Hello everyone, this is Marcy. Welcome to yet another video about Thiwaproma. Now before I get started, I have just noticed that I've passed 100 subscribers. Thank you very much everyone. It means quite a good deal that uh, you guys out there enjoy the stuff I make, uh, find them a little bit interesting. I know it's mostly a hodgepodge because I just put anything I like on this channel be it gaming videos, uh, drawing or art related stuff and conlang stuff. I just put anything on my channel. So it just means a lot that you are willing to endure through all the junk I toss your way. Uh, but enough about that. Thank you so much again. We're going to now talk about the oddities of Magokla Guaya. This has been a a topic that I wanted to t discuss about or to present for quite a bit because Magokla Guaya is quite a topic, especially for Thiwaproma. So without further ado, let's just jump in with our first and foremost question. What is Magokla Guaya? Magokla Guaya is the writing system of Thiwaproma. It is written from right to left, it is written with a brush on paper, and it is, I guess you could say, an incomplete syllabary. What is an incomplete syllabary? Well, here it is. As you can see up top, here's the syllabary part, but there's also an alphabet over here, alongside some minor diacritics. This is what I mean by incomplete syllabary. Uh, you can also see that there are a few little intricacies sprawled all across this chart. Things that you might notice, like that have asterisks, like this S column and this Y column, and also the fact that it has two Ws and this NG or N column, that too is also asterisked. These things will be tackled a little bit further in the video, but one thing that might strike you, uh, I guess the first thing that might strike you would be these little empty boxes over here. Why are they empty? Well, that's because that a long time ago that these symbols over here used to be a part of this syllabary. How and why? Well, that's because this tailored somewhat back to the first version of this uh, writing system. The top syllabary is the first version of Magokla Guaya. It was created from a different culture, not the same as the speakers of the Waprama, the Nabuthro. These were a different type of people. They, were, they called themselves the Tlasilejo. And they had a logographic writing system until it became this little syllabary or the protosyllabary, and then eventually morphed into uh, a more closer relative to Magokla Guaya syllabary that we see in modern Thiwaproma. The more developed or more streamlined version of the syllabary from above was written in clay. The very first iterations were chiseled onto stone. Eventually they used clay and a stylus to kind of draw uh, the symbols on, and that's where the word uh, Magokla Guaya somewhat came from. It means like clay writing or clay drawing. Um, and as you can see, there are some of the symbols here that kind of look very similar to the ones you see in Magokla Guaya. When the Nabuthra first took these symbols, they already realized that a lot of the sounds that uh, these symbols, these glyphs, represented were not of Thiwaproma. For example, there is the uvular plosive over there, the qa, that does not exist in Thiwaproma even back then. They don't even have this affricate uh, sound. Uh, they don't even have this lateral. Actually, they... No, they actually do still have... They have somewhat this lateral uh, affricate. Is it lateral? Yeah, the lateral alveolar affricate. But it wasn't that common. And not to mention, they didn't have the uh, 
the uvular to the R, essentially. So they had to remap a lot of the syllabary's uh, glyphs, uh, not only by their little series, the series of glyphs that they represented, but also kind of remapped a whole lot of symbols to different sounds uh, according to their needs. Now, uh, the adoption of this syllabary was pretty early on in the life or the development of the Waprama. So not a lot of sound changes has occurred uh, during that time. There were no coda liquid changing the vowels, none of that has happened yet. Uh, no consonant changes that would eventually ravage the phonology of the Waproma, and it hasn't gone through a lot of its stress-timed reduction. But things go about, and this system has still persisted all the way to the modern day. It is incredibly difficult for outsiders to learn because it's a real mess, but uh, here are, I guess you could say, the first things that they uh, a new learner of Magoku Goyo would first come about. The first thing is that in the syllabary, how would you write syllables in general? Because as I've mentioned in my phonology video, uh, do check it out if you haven't, uh, there are codas that are allowed. Tlasi uh, Lego, or at least the uh, first uh, iterations of Tlasi Lego didn't have codas. The Waprama, on the other hand, does. How did it handle it? They would have a flipping diacritic, which we will eventually get to in the diacritic section, which would eventually pair with a corresponding uh, vowel. For example, if you wanted to go write, uh, say, pop, P-A-P, you would take the word, the, the syllable pa, and then put the flipping diacritic onto the following pa, uh, to make it up. So pa, up, became pop because the vowels uh, matched, essentially. Uh, so how about o and u, particularly u, because as you can see, there is no u uh, row in this syllabary. How did they manage it? Well, for consonant series that have uh, an o, have an o uh, series, then they would use that followed with the letter u. So ko u is ku and o ok, uh, u ok, sorry, is uk. Makes sense. But what about for syllables that don't have an o series? Well, they would take the letter a uh, or the a series. So pa o becomes po and o up is op. This would also apply for u. What's interesting about this system is that you're also able to flip O series syllables to also kind of add to the O-ness, to kind of provide the, I guess you could say the nucleus vowel. Uh, here's what I mean. Pa ok becomes bok, and ko up becomes kop. I think you get the idea. It's a lot of vowel matching, essentially. It's wonky, but you could get around it. Another thing about spelling, or one of the intricacies of spelling using the system, is how are you supposed to write down schwa? Because uh, schwa is present in a lot of the beginnings of Thiwaprama words such as these, Banai, Togo, Fachon. These are, this is a pretty prevalent feature of the Waproma. So how did it go about uh, writing it? Well, uh, for syllables, the A series uh, consonants or syllables would be used to represent that schwa. So ba ma became ba ma. And for the alphabet letters, like the letter F, like F, they just didn't write any vowel in between. So F. Ma is fma. Makes sense. So how would you write down a? Because there are some words in the Waproma that do have a initial a. Well, then they had to rewrite the a. So pa ma is pama or pama, 
And fa ma, this this makes sense because it's an alphabet. Fa ma is fa ma. Okay, neat. Back in my phonology video, I've also mentioned that the waprama also has initial clusters. It could allow initial clusters, essentially. So how would that be represented? They would flip the syllable character at the front and then follow it with the uh, following consonant syllable, essentially. So ap ra became pra, and fra is just fra. Really, really intuitive. So that pretty much concludes the syllabary. Again, the asterisked uh, series or syllables, I'll explain a little bit further into the video. But for now, uh, I do want to briefly mention the alphabet. Just briefly, because there's not a lot of interesting things from the alphabet. Uh, I guess the most interesting you could ever get is the fact that there are two W's over here. And I guess the nasalization is technically like it doesn't seem like a letter but again i'll get to that in a bit uh the alphabet is just completely what you expect it represents one sound be it a consonant or a vowel so the diacritics there are three of them the voiced and that basically turns unvoiced which are is basically the most of the uh, syllables into voiced so we have ka to ga Makes sense. The flipped, as I mentioned previously, flips the order of the consonant and the vowel, so from ka to ak. And the voiced flip turns, it flips it, but also voices it, so from ka to ag. All right, that makes a lot of sense. For certain sets of uh, syllabaries, particularly, they can yield different results of what what happens when they flip essentially so from ri to ir it becomes ia and from uh, ya to ai it's just ai that makes sense and from cha to ash when you flip it it becomes ash uh this has once again to deal with the phonotactics but also the phonological evolution of the language now um you might be wondering why isn't the nasal character a diacritic and that's because the nasal character or the this nasal quote-unquote diacritic also has a role in liaison you see if a word ends in a nasal vowel like on or an and the following word begins in a vowel there is this ghost m that exists that uh kind of like bleeds over into the other uh, to make to become the onset of the following word i'm sure that if you look up liaison if you talk about it it you'll eventually understand it again french is a very good really close uh, european example of what liaison or sandi can look like so i recommend you reading up about how that works uh but yeah we've basically completed all of the symbols except for once again these ones which i wanted to put a bit more stress on. So the Y series or the Y series, uh, for most of uh, the symbols, they're pretty easy to understand. They're very standard, like there's Ya, there's Yi, and there's Ye. So according to the initial rules, which I've mentioned, that means if you want to write down, say, Yo, you would put Ya and then O because there's no O in this series. Well, no, if you do that, it becomes Go. Why? How? So wait, how do you actually write down yo? Well, you use the letter y, the actual alphabet letter y, and then write that with o and u to make yo and you. If you put o and you after ya, it just becomes go and gu. Why? This harbors back to the old syllabary. Uh, back then, it used to represent, or this particular tile used to represent G, and that used to be a phoneme in older versions of Thiwaproma. But as time went on, G became either Y or G. It either became the palatal approximant or the velar uh, plosive, uh, the voiced velar plosive specifically. 
And because of this, it still retains that kind of reading into the modern language. So uh, the first three is ya, ye, ye. However, if you try and make or try to spell it with o and u, it becomes gon gu because again, this is like the split in the uh, phonological evolution. G became y before a, e, and e, and also schwa. Uh, not schwa, actually. I'm not sure about schwa. I'll need to check that again. Um, but it became g before a and u. Right. So next we have the W characters. Why is there two W characters? Uh, well, that's because that one is used as the onset, which is why there's an O, and the other one is used for the uh, coda, which is the C. Now, coda W isn't really a word anymore. Not a word, sorry. Isn't a letter anymore. And that's because uh, a lot of sound changes especially happen to the vowel, and it just becomes a rounding marker, essentially. So, E plus coda W becomes U. It makes sense. It's understandable. These two symbols used to be used pretty interchangeably. It was just a stylistic choice. But as the language changed, uh, there was a lot of pressure to use one symbol over the other to represent either the W sound or the rounding that it occurred with. So, yeah, it's just arbitrary decisions, essentially. So finally on the list, we have Eng, or the Ng letter. And you might have noticed from my phonology video that Eng doesn't really exist. The velar nasal doesn't exist in modern Thiwaproma. It used to exist in previous iterations of it, but not anymore. Similar to the Y series, the one over here on the left, which used to be G and then eventually split into G or Y, depending on the vowel, uh, vowel, the vowel following it. How did I make vowel into vowel? Eng's pronunciation eventually split into two, depending on the following vowel. So if A E or I followed it, it became an N. So ng a is pronounced as na. And ng o or u, basically the backgrounded vowels, became wo or wu. Uh, well, wu isn't really permitted in the Waprama, so it became vu instead. Again, really, really weird and kooky and strange. And as you can see, this is just historical spelling. All of this, well, most of this is historical spelling. Because there is no reason, like, you know, logical reason for these guys to just hold on to this Aang character, except to preserve a very, very old spelling, probably 500 or so years ago. And there is a lot to go about. I've just basically covered the surface of it, and I'm sure that there is a lot more I could talk about. But a lot of it just gets boring and repetitive, so I'm going to spare you all of those nitty-gritty details. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. I'd be happy to answer them. However, I do want to end on a high note. There is a... <laughs> Sorry, it's like... <laughs> it's the funniest thing, and also somewhat the, the craziest thing about this writing system. You see, there is a set of syllables in this language that just confounds me. It's just, it amazes me. And that is the S series. Um, the S series is a particularly special set of syllables because that it has whopping seven different types of pronunciations. So let's break this down. First of all, it could be pronounced as sh before any consonant, l after most consonants, r after t or d. It is pronounced y between vowels, but if it begins an unstressed syllable, and is pronounced sh instead if it begins a stressed syllable, and if it's written with the voicing diacritic, it becomes s. 
just like the name of the series, and if it's between vowels, it becomes Z. Hoo boy, I'm honestly really impressed and very pleased with the outcome of this. And the reason why is because of phonological evolution, which I'll talk about some other time. But for now, I've spent quite a good amount of energy explaining the very surface level, or a good good part of the uh, basics of Magokla Gawaii. Uh I'm personally really tired. I'm, I was basically pretty fatigued recording this video, but whatever. I'm just happy I got to express this. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this little video about a writing system. Again, if you have any comments, just leave them in the comments section. Any questions? Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Until then, Banayuga Maridu Filoyena Rado. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are on the world. Bye bye!